Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, Continuous Commissioning, Stopping Your Building's Ongoing Drift Toward Inefficiency. I'm John Davies, Vice President and Senior Analyst at GreenBiz Group, and I also lead the GreenBiz Executive Network, our member-based peer-to-peer learning forum for sustainability professionals. Today's topic is one that top energy managers really understand that measuring building performance shouldn't be a one-time event. We should have a great discussion today about the importance of continuous commissioning. And as I look at uh, everyone who's logged in today, I'm pleased, as always, to welcome listeners from around the world. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping details. The console you're looking at on your screen allows you to increase the size of any of the panels by clicking the full screen button on the right-hand side. If you have questions for today's speakers, simply type your question or message into the Q&A window at the bottom left of the slide window. The chat feature on the bottom right allows you to interact and discuss the content of today's topic with other webcast viewers. For any technical difficulties, a help button is located on the upper right corner of your screen. <clears throat> and one of the questions we always get, you can download the slides from today's webcast by going to the download slides pod on the bottom right of your screen. Also, today's webcast is being recorded and will be available on demand starting in a few hours. If you're on Twitter, the hashtag for today's event is pound GRNBZ. Feel free to share what you're learning with the Twitter sphere. Now let's get going. Buildings are in a constant drift toward inefficiency. The signs are often there in the form of higher utility bills. And in a worst case scenario, equipment failure and costly emergency repairs might be the first sign of a real problem. Today's webcast will include a discussion of the continuous commissioning guideline developments from ASHRAE and how facilities and energy managers are developing a long-term strategy for ongoing portfolio optimization. Joining me today are Jim Boche, President of Commissioning Concepts, Scott Gordon, Engineering and Development Manager for Johnson Controls, and Dale Dyer, Plant Operations Manager for Western Kentucky Universities. After we hear from Jim, Scott, and Dale, we'll take your questions. But Keep, keep them coming throughout the webcast as you think of them. We're going to have a lot of time to try and get to all the questions, so type them in at any time. Jim, let me pass it off to you, uh, President of Commissioning Concepts, Jim Boche. Thanks, John. I do have to make one little correction, John. It's ongoing commissioning, not continuous commissioning. Our friends at Texas A&M have copyrighted that term. They get a little upset oh. to use that, so it's... <laughs> Ongoing commissioning. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of the ongoing commissioning process. Um, and then later on, the Scott and the other team will take it on to more advanced levels. <clears throat> uh, ongoing commissioning is basically the way we're trying to get higher performance out of our buildings. There's four things that are required to get a high-performance building. First is it has to be designed correctly. It must be constructed to a high quality standard. It must be fully commissioned and functional, and the operators need to fully understand how to operate that system. Just like a stool. If you have a four-legged stool and you take one leg away, the stool falls over. In building operations, if you don't have these four things, then your building will not be a high-performing building. So what is ongoing commissioning? It's the continuous improvement process within a building. Uh, and it is the improvement of the indoor air environment, the indoor environment, and its reduction in energy and water use. Now, the reason it's important to know if your environment is correct, if you have a building where the people are not comfortable and their productivity suffers, then it doesn't matter how energy efficient that building is, it's still going to be a bad building. So we have to make sure that we're delivering a building for what it's intended to do, that is keeping the occupants comfortable where they can work or do whatever they're supposed to be doing in that building. So that's an important key. Uh, starting point, of course, you should start with a fully functional building. 
all the systems should actually be working the way they're intended to do. So if you're delivering a brand new building and it's been fully commissioned and it is fully functional, then you can start the ongoing commissioning process without any problem. Now, if you've got a new building and it turns out that uh, not everything has been done correctly through the process and there are still some things that are not working correctly, and most of you building managers will understand that perfectly, well, then you simply do a small retro commissioning project on the features of the systems that are not functioning and bring them into a normal good operating procedure so you can start an ongoing commissioning process. So ongoing commissioning can be launched in a brand new building and it can be launched in an existing building because the processes are the same. The two core concepts of ongoing commissioning is the first is you have to measure your performance. If you don't measure your performance, you can never change it. You can't get better or worse if you don't know where you're at. You have to do the measurements. So we normally measure electrical use, gas use, any other purchased energy use, water use, and we also measure indoor, air, uh, in, indoor environmental quality. And that consists of comfort, IAQ or indoor air quality, lighting quality, and acoustic quality. Um, the first uh, measurements are fairly easy. The IEQ is not so easy to do. The second core concept is uh, performance measurement. You compare the, what you've measured, you've got the, the, your use data, and you measure that against previous use data. Normally it's the previous year's data. Or you compare it to peer groups. <clears throat> peer group data is interesting to know whether you're doing a good job against your peers or whether you've got lots of opportunity to make changes within your building. So peer groups are, 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 are valuable for us to do that. Uh, the other thing we need to do uh, it, with ongoing commissioning is we need to publish the results. And we need to publish the results of our efforts to management, to operators, and to occupants. Now, it's very important to get occupants involved in this program you're going to create because they have the power to, 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 to affect what you're doing. I mean, occupants can leave windows and doors open when they, when they shouldn't be. They can, they can turn heaters on in their desk uh, instead of changing the temperature in the room. There's a lot of things that they can do that affect the temperature and the efficiency and the comfort within the building. So you need to get them on your side. It's important to have managers on your side so they keep funding what you want to do. But those three, it's very important that we publish the data to them. So how do you get started? Um, first of all, you have to create a commissioning plan. You have to figure out what you're going to do. So you have to figure out what you're going to measure, who is going to do the measurements, when are the measurements going to be done, how will the results be analyzed, and how will you publish the results. Now, normally measurements um, depends on the type of system you have to gather data, but normally measurements start with utility bills. That's actually a meter measurement. That's the easy one to do. Or you might have submeters that you have to physically measure or gather uh, that measurement data from them. Now, IEQ is much more difficult. You can actually measure IEQ. They have suites of instruments, and you can take them into uh, spaces to do that. However, it's very, very expensive, and it's very intrusive in the spaces. The only people I know that are actually measuring hard data on IEQ is colleges and universities that have grants to do research projects. Normally, uh, a, an office building or a normal building would never actually measure the, the, those components unless there was a problem. Now, the way we normally do those measurements is with occupant surveys. Now, when I say occupant surveys, building managers go screaming down the halls because they don't want to do a survey of their occupants. Um, they have enough complaints. They don't want to try to generate more. But what we actually recommend is an online blind survey done through email. The building occupants have no opportunity to actually just launch complaints. That's a scientific survey, and it, uh, it's, like I said, it's a blind survey. It works very well, and it's very, very cost effective. We also have to, when we analyze the data, we normally normalize results. And the reason we normalize results is so that we're not skewing the data of our performance. We want to actually know if we're doing better or worse. We don't want some uh, event skewing the data that would then affect what we're trying to do. Normally, we normalize data for billing days. The utilities have a bad habit of not being uh, common billing days per month. So we normalize it so that the, if, we're, if we're evaluating this month against last year's month, we want to make sure they have same same amount of days in the period we're looking at. 
we want we might normalize it for weather and we might normalize it for people uh, every job might be a little bit different than what we normalize it for but we normalize the data so we don't um, affect the outcome so how do you get started well there's two there's two or three ways to do ongoing commissioning <clears throat> One is to do a manual system, and a manual system is very simple, simply a spreadsheet. Collect your utility bills, put them in there, compare to passives, you're just trying to get a feel for where you're going. Very simple. We normally use the ASHRAE PMP Best Practice Guide, which is um, performance measurement protocols. It's a, a manual that ASHRAE has produced that actually tells you how to do all the stuff, how to do these measurements, how to analyze the data, and all that is in there. Or you can have an automated system. And automated systems may use a dashboard on your DDC system, or it may use an online smart system. <clears throat> there are different systems that you can buy to do this. My recommendation would be, even if you're going to use a dashboard or you, you've signed up for an online system, that you still start with a manual system. It's good to have the knowledge of what you're doing and how you go through it. The reason also for that is that the automated systems are actually data gathering systems. And they're going to gather a lot of data for you, but they don't normally publish results except for maybe a dashboard. And so you need some more components of the people side of the equation, which the manual system will give you. So I would always recommend starting with both and then slide your data acquisition over as you get familiar with what's going on. The continuous improvement process is, um, <coughs> is fairly simple. You have a measurement plan. You collect the data. You analyze the data, uh, then you normalize the data, and then you compare it against the baseline, and you compare it against past results, and then you report the results to the managers, operators, and occupants. Then you decide what changes could you make to be better. So then you make those changes, and then always verify that the changes you made actually work, and then you remeasure the results, and the process starts over. It's simply a continuous loop that goes over and over and over. And normally the time period is every month, but you could do with an automated system. You could do hourly, you could do weekly, but monthly is normal because that matches utility bills. The ASHRAE PMP guide, there's two guides. There's a basic PMP guide and there's a best practice guide. The best practice guide covers energy use, water use, and on the four IEQ uh, performance areas. It's designed to be low cost or no cost so that building managers and operators can do this themselves without hiring a consultant. Uh, it also has in it a disk that has a lot of um, features um, out there for you. It's got some spreadsheets that are all pre-set up for water use and for energy use. Uh, this happens to be a water use sheet, and you do have to customize these sheets <coughs> uh, so that they adequately reflect the uh, bill, uh, your utility bill, because every utility has different kinds of fees and different items, but they are customizable, and you, you put the data in there, and you put the data for last year, and then it throws out results. This uh, this happens to be a water tool, and it, this is showing you the water use. It, it has a speedometer. Uh, green is good. Red is bad. <clears throat> it has uh, some, some data over here. It has the WUI data, gallons used per year per square foot, and that sort of thing. Then it has a line chart year to date. With a, it also has a bar chart in calmer fashion to do that. Um, uh, I, oh well, it doesn't work. <clears throat> the arrow can't get the arrow to go where I want it to go. <clears throat> then we also have over there variance charts that will tell you a trend line to whether you're getting better or worse. And then not only does it do it in units, but it also does a set of graphs in dollars. And this, of course, would be most important to managers to see how they're doing compared to last year, what their trend line of the variances are. So these output uh, outputs are all automated, and they're in the, the Excel spreadsheets that come with the performance guide. This happens to be the energy tool. It's exactly the same. You can do more than one meter. You can aggregate meters in the, in the sheet. It has the output the same in units, and this is EUI units. And then it has the cost output. It does exactly the same. shows you the year-to-date and also shows you the variance calculations. Now, the ASHRAE PMP guide is written in three different levels. The first level is the basic process in just using utility bills and general data and a general occupant survey. <clears throat> now, there is another level, level two, which is a diagnostic measurement level. What happens there is when you find you have an issue, you may need to go to level two to go in and take some specific measurements in the building to figure out what's going on and how to do a correction. Or if you find you have a little bigger problem, you may need to go to level three, which is the advanced analysis level. 
and that may require bringing in consultants and maybe require some uh, retro commissioning efforts in that level to actually fix what's going on in the building. But this is a continuous process, so the ongoing commissioning is always looking at ways to make the building better. This system does work. Uh, I have reduced buildings. Uh, people have hired us to come in and do it 10% a year, and we have been able to make that 10% without too much trouble by looking at what we're doing and how to correct it. So it's an ongoing process that works and is easy to do. John? Jim, that, that's a lot of great information, and you obviously have a, a lot of experience you bring and, and probably a lot of war stories. So one of the questions um, that we want to ask is, what are some of the common misconceptions about ongoing commissioning? Well, I, I would think that the one misconception I has is uh, that I, I've received is that, that it's a commissioning process. And it is, but that's probably really not the right word for it. That's what the industry calls it. But it's probably ongoing operations would be a better word. Um, uh, commissioning has this set of connotations that it's a whole lot of paperwork. Whereas ongoing commissioning is really not much paperwork, but really a lot of concentration on the results. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we'll come back to a, a few of the other questions. But, but let's move on right now and go to Scott Gordon, Engineering and Development Manager for Johnson Controls. Scott? All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I think I got ahead one click there. No, nope, there we are. All right, so my presentation today is um, will provide an update of ASHRAE's work with existing building commissioning and also go over a few uh, methods of how ongoing commissioning is performed today. Um, yeah, ASHRAE has been working on, is currently working on a couple of existing building commissioning guidelines or what the industry calls EBCX. Um, the first is guideline 0.2. And uh, 0 0.2 is the commissioning process for existing buildings and assemblies. And the, the second guideline is 1.2, which is the commissioning process for existing HVAC and R systems. So yeah, the 0 0.2 is written to provide a process that, that can be used to commission uh, any type of existing system within a building. So uh, uh, any system in a building most commonly commissioned would be HVAC and controls, you know, electrical system, uh, plumbing system, building envelope, you know, vertical transportation, elevators, escalators. Uh, you know, 1.2 follows the process of 0 0.2, applying the existing building commission process specifically towards HVAC and our systems. So uh, you know, 0 0.2 has six phases of existing building commissioning. They're all listed there. And the, the final phase is ongoing commissioning, which is what the focus of this presentation is, is about. So um, you know, guideline 0 0.2 has been, it's been um, worked on for uh, uh, going on like seven years now. It's expected to be, to be released for public review either late 2013 or early 2014. And guideline 1.2 is anticipated to be released in the summer of 2014 for, for public review. So why is ongoing commissioning important? You know, every every new building after it's constructed turns immediately into an existing building, which which adds to the currently you know massive inventory of existing buildings. You know, and existing buildings they have a, a common problem, as as Jim alluded to in his presentation. You know, they suffer from loss of performance. Uh, ranging from high energy consumption, poor indoor environmental quality, poor IAQ, poor occupant comfort. And even when a, a building is set up and is running efficiently when it's originally constructed or remodeled, with, without some type of a plan in place to maintain a high level of performance, you know, that system performance, it, it will degrade over time. And you know, that, that degradation, it's, it's due to a multitude of problems ranging from faults such as you know, manual overrides or reset schedules, uh, leaking control valves, inoperable, inoperable economizers, and just a, a wide range of deferred maintenance issues. So a, a study by Texas A&M in 2009 determined that an average energy saving 
of 6% per year is lost due to slippage and system performance after a commissioning event. And yeah, I, I think that's very conservative. And you know, savings, slippage, it, it, it's not equally, you know, 6% a year, it could, you could lose a lot one year. Certain measures like uh, control ch changes, um, those are easily changed and, and modified in the field. So, and that could generate a, a large degree of slippage. So ongoing commissioning addresses the challenge of degradation of building performance um, by ensuring that you know, system performance is to persist over time and can actually improve. So um, different levels of ongoing commissioning is, as Jim Boshe, pre Jim Boshe previously shared, there's a multiple methods of implementing an ongoing commissioning program. At the most basic level, a, a scheduled on-site visit is made to manually review performance of building systems. Yeah, this is a, a manual process, typically includes reviewing items such as um, building automation system, BAS trend data, set points, and utility data. Uh, also, generally interviews with a facility operations team is also performed, and that's a, a great point Jim made, you know, just to really get the people that that manage the building and run the building, occupy the building to, to, to help um, paint the picture with a broad broad paintbrush to figure out you know, what some of the challenges are and to help identify potential problem areas that may require further investigation. The, the next level of ongoing commissioning typically re re includes some type of a remote connection to the building through the BAS. And you know, that could be such as a VPN connection to the to the building automation system in the building. Yeah, this this um, type of connection allows an ongoing commissioning engineer to remotely access trends and data, um, saving time to travel to sites that are, are maybe distant. And um, often this, this data can be imported into other analysis tools to help identify potential faults and problem areas that require further investigation. Um, you know, leveraging technology further is a cloud-based platform that provides some um, FDD fault detection and diagnostic capabilities. You know, fault detection is the recognition of undesirable abnormalities occurring in equipment and systems in a building. And then the, the fault diagnostics is the isolation of a root, you know, the root cause of the, of the problem. So with, with FDD, everything is a question and answer scenario. You know, the, the detection and diagnostic process is automated by software, you know, asking a rules-based question, and then you know, running this data, running data control points through algorithms to detect and then diagnose the fault. Actually, the, the detection is much easier to achieve than the, the actual diagnostics, um, which there's lots of reasons for that if you just you know, think of you, you go to the, the doctor and they can tell that um, you have high blood pressure, but then to, that's the detection, but now to diagnose what's causing it, it's a whole other another process there. So FDD is applied to all types of building systems. It's a, a rules-based, um, you know, there's a library of rules uh, the, with the ability of altering conditions to break the rules, thereby trigger, which triggers a fault notification of some sort. So your rules or rule sets are created to integrate multiple fault reports, such as suppressing a load if there are any faults reported from a source serving the load. So you know, a good example of this is a chiller plant. Let's say uh, a pump fails, a condenser water pump fails, and a chiller plant drop, you know, um, drops off, and now all the air handlers are going to start to fault out. But it's not the fault of the air handlers; it's the fault of the chiller plant. So FDD would be able to put all this together and connect all the dots and suppress the faults from the air handlers, knowing that the, the true fault is at the, the, the primary fault is at the chiller plant. So FDDs combine data from multiple sources to um, infer events or patterns that suggest more complicated circumstances. For another example is the FDD for air handling units that may take into account set points. And discharge air temperature, duct static pressure, damper position, zone temperatures, all these different points, and determine um, what the possible problem could be um, based on the position of all these different um, points in a system. 
So this is um, the next few slides just show some example um, shots of um, FCD screen captures. This is a, an example of a typical fault um, on an on air handling unit where the heating valve is at 100 percent. And so this is a preheat valve. And you can actually see the outside air temperature is 90 degrees. So obviously, when the outside air temperature is 90 degrees, the preheat does not have to be on. So what this is causing now is a, a heating up and then overcooling. So just a, a just a total waste of energy. So uh, next one here. This is a more complicated, complex um, FDD. So the the shot on the left side of the screen um, is actually a um, chiller curve, the chiller efficiency curve for a particular chiller. So this is actual um, chiller efficiency curve for a chiller at this site. And then that curve is used to establish the expected chiller performance, um, which is shown in COP or coefficient of performance. Uh, COP is, is uh, similar to uh, looking at a car, a car um, miles per gallon is just the efficiency. The higher the miles per gallon, the more efficient the, the, the mileage is on the car with COP, the higher the COP, the more efficient the chiller is. So you can see that the expected COP is up uh, over 12 and a half, and the, this, this particular chiller is running just over a 10. So there's something causing that reduction in performance. Um, going to this next slide, you can see that this is a different chiller curve. You can see this, this chiller efficiency curve is actually um, flatter than, than this curve. See how this curve is steeper? That's just a characteristic of that particular chiller as a side, side point. Now we can see that the actual and expected COP for this chiller is operating right on line. So this chiller is, is you, you, you can't get any more efficiency out of this chiller than we're already getting. But it's right, and it's doing what it's supposed to do based on the, the detection of the performance. Uh, this is a, a fault that um, shows a reheat valve that is just out of tune. You can see that the, the, um, this, the up and down line here, this is the output to the control valve um, a command, so like 0 to 10, 0 being closed, 10 being wide open. And you can just see it just keeps on hunting up and down, up and down, opening and closing. So there, there, there could be multiple causes for this. It could be the, the control loop needs to be retuned. It could be the control valve is actually oversized. Um, but there is a, a problem there. And that causes excessive wear and tear on the valve and the actuator of, the, of that control valve. Uh, this, this fault um, shows that. This is for a VV box, so the supplier set point on this is probably somewhere around 50 to 75, which is very low for a box of this size. So theoretically, this box should, should essentially be closed, but it's delivering over 1,250 CFM of air. So this box, there's something, something wrong with this box again. So again, um, detecting there's a fault here is the easy part. Diagnosing exactly what's going on here is the the, um, the challenging part with FCD. So this uh, this example here is a discharge air temperature. Um, we can see that the um, this is in heating mode. Obviously, the air temperature is oscillating between 75 and 100 degrees. Um, the preheat valve is up to 100 percent, and the the core valve is having to come up to 40 percent. Um, just you know, there's um, this is just out of, out of tune. It's just fighting back and forth. Um, you can see the heating and cooling are just in a constant combat between trying to um, control this control this set point. So just a, just really looks like it's just an out of tune and just needs to be retuned. Um, again, detecting it is is much easier. So this this final. Um, shot here just shows a peak demand. We all understand how important reducing and minimizing demand charges can be. Uh, you know, um, demand response is just, uh, uh, it's just taken off here in the last several, you know, three to five years. So this shot here shows that the peak demand is usually running right around 100 kW. But something happened here this time that peaked it up 
And if you um, kind of take an average between that 120 and 140, you know, 130 kW, so there's a, some kind of act, some activity occurred here that to increase that um, demand by 30 kW. So just simple numbers that um, they had a demand charge of $10 per kW. That one event there is a $300 event that um, the customer would would um, be impacted with. So I believe that that's it there. John, I'll hand it back off to you now. All right, thanks, Scott. Well, I've got a, a couple of questions that have come in that maybe we should address right right up front. So one uh, question is, so what is typically required in order to gain access into a building's network so this FDD and ongoing commissioning can be performed remotely? Right, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, a very important question. So. Um, Actually, every building is different. Um, there is a readiness that has to occur um, depending on if it's, say, a, a BACnet-enabled building or if it's not a BACnet-enabled building, then there would have to be some type of gateway installed in the control system so we have access and, and bring, bring that, the raw data up into the cloud so these high-level analytics could be done. So it's really... Um, contingent on the, the type of system that's in a building and um, how open it is or if it's proprietary. So that's, um, but that, that is a, a great, great question. And, and sort of a follow-up before we switch over to, to Dale, um, we got another question that uh, the, the efficiency curves that you showed, um, one of our attendees here said, you know, that manufacturers don't seem to publish them. Is there a way for, for people to get to those efficiency curves? Right, right. So um, that is that can can be a challenge. Um, you know, if if you um, can get the, um, the the model serial number on a chiller and just contact the local um, you know supplier of that chiller. Um, sometimes the, the the data isn't put into a curve format. You may it may be in a table format, so you may get that table format and it'll have, it'll show um, percent load um, and KW per ton or COP and uh, often um, entering condensed water temperature. There's a lot of variables involved there. So it may be in a table format and from that table format you can convert it over into a, a curve. Oh, that's great. Well, we have some other questions, but, but I think we're going to move on first uh, and, and finish up with our presentations and I'd like to introduce Dale Dyer, Plan Operations Manager for Western Kentucky University. Uh, yes, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm here basically to, to tell you that we've got several systems installed, and, and the, the two presenters ahead of me were fantastic. You know, they, they basically covered many of the things that we're doing in the uh, I'm, I'm going to share a success story or, or two with you and, and, and tell you that uh, uh, the capabilities are endless and, and we, we're out there every, every day just, just making it happen on this campus. Uh, there was a case study that we participated in with, with John's Controls. It's, it's great reading. Um, we were one of the early opters in, in the panoptics. We've had the system up and going since about January of this year with the initial 22 buildings. We've since made the decision to add 17 more. Uh, we're still in the build out on that, which is uh, soon, to, excuse me, soon to go live here in the next, uh, next few days. So, so looking forward to that. Uh, we've also been a partner with Johns Controls on, on a, a, a number of fronts with uh, an ESPC uh, that recently uh, finished up the construction uh, ended on that about 18 months ago. The M&V actually started uh, in the July a year ago. And with everything that we've done this, this past fiscal year, uh, we were actually able to document that we have reduced electrical usage on this campus by 16%. We're also a campus that has done uh, a lot of building, uh, expanding. When everything is, is factored into account with the expanded uh, square footage, we're at about 5.4 million square feet. 
we've actually reduced our usage on a square foot basis by slightly over 20, 21%. So we're, uh, we're very pleased with the results that we're seeing. And, and if I break up on you from time to time, forgive me. Uh, I've, I've had a cold here for the last several days and struggling a bit, but I'm doing okay. But anyway, on, on, with, uh, on with that, our building square foot has increased since 2008 by about 5%. So, you know, the 16 and the, and the 5, fairly easy math to get it to 21. We've uh, also uh, built in our building lead buildings. Uh, we're, we're dedicated to that here on this campus. We've got one lead gold online, one lead silver online, another that's awaiting uh, silver certification. We've got a renovation, a major renovation in, prog in progress that will actually be a lead silver and a new construction that's planned to start in February uh, that's, that's right now looking like it's going to be a, a lead gold application. In our um, ESPC, we invested around $9.7 million. The guaranteed payback on that investment was just over a million dollars a year. And, and I'm really pleased to be able to report that at the end of our first year of M&D, uh, we exceeded that guarantee by about 30%. And, and ended up at a, at a million three plus. One of the ways that we got there, along with our ESPC, I mentioned that uh, we brought Panoptics in uh, back in January. In the first six months of, of Panoptics, and you heard quite a lot about Panoptics with, with the previous presentation, and, and I can I can assure you that um, every fault and every uh, improvement or inefficiency that was demonstrated there, uh, I can tell you we found in the first six months of operation. And, and to monetize that, uh, that finding and correction of those faults uh, netted us well over $200,000 out of our utility budget and actual savings in the first six months. We had that uh, in-depth analytics up and going. It's, uh, it's really been a great tool uh, for me and for the university. Uh, we've, we've actually uh, saved enough utility funds with what we've done ongoing to reinvest those, those utility savings into um, other projects that also save us uh, a considerable amount. We, we've uh, purchased new natural gas boilers. The savings have been that large. Replaced some older coal boilers. We're in the process of a LED lighting upgrade. It was also funded entirely from our from our utility savings. So we're we're a we're a success story for sure. Um, Pan optics we we use in a couple of ways. We've um, make great use of the continuous diagnostics module. I have a technician that, that dedicates about four hours a day, roughly, uh, to going through and keeping up with what we're seeing for faults, getting those corrected, and uh, constantly working. Like I say, every fault you saw demonstrated, we, we found on this campus that would otherwise have been invisible to us. We've got about uh, 380 separate utility bills that, that come through here. Within this energy management group, we always have, since 2008, tracked these so that we understand them, uh, authorized payment for them. But that was really about it. I mean, manual data entry, um, fairly intense, keeping up with spreadsheets, um, being able to analyze this stuff from a spreadsheet basis over the years. Once we brought Panoptics into the picture, uh, we, we've now got that automated. Some of the data is still manually entered for the time being. We we're actually uh, ready to go live with, with electronic data transfer directly from the utility in January. But being able to track this in one place in Panoptics uh, through, the, through the Carbon and Energy Reporter has, has been a great labor saver. It's, it's decreased uh, the, the space for error with our spreadsheets. We actually reported a much, um, a much smaller savings in, in our first 
year with the ESPC based on our spreadsheet data, uh, only to find out that after we started up Panoptics and put the same data side by side, we ended up reporting 13 months off in our spreadsheet instead of 12. So when, once we get the two corrected, uh, our, our, our savings looked a whole lot better, but that's just one downside to trying to track everything through spreadsheets. Uh, I did hear of one university here in Kentucky that's actually using 23 separate spreadsheets. Uh, I commend the man to, to keep up with that. Uh, we, we were using about eight, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, really impressed that we're using Panoptics now and able to do the same thing in one spot much quicker, being able to dem uh, develop reports for building operators, for administrators that, that are easily understood. Um, that there is a, there's a whole lot you know, within this panoptics that we're just um, thrilled with. I'd, I'd be happy to share links with anybody who wants to, wants to get into this stuff. But um, we, we are, a, a, again, a success story here at Western Kentucky University. Uh, very, very happy with, with what we have and uh, looking forward to a continued expansion of, of the panoptics here on, the, on this campus. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think that's it for me. All right, Dale. Uh, so that was great. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of different kinds of questions here we're going to try and get to. But I, I guess the first one is, what, what were some of the biggest challenges, and this is for you, Dale, um, what were some of the biggest challenges in implementing ongoing commissioning? Now you said you started with spreadsheets and, and have moved on to more automated. What, what were some of the big hurdles that you were able to overcome? Uh, actually, we've got a rather extensive medicine system on campus. So, so we had a lot of the data in there, but the, uh, the, the, the data in, in medicine the trends aren't long-term, only a few days, and then, then you kind of run out of room. Being able to bring that, that data over into that continuous diagnostics module uh, through the gateway and, and up to the cloud and having that available to, to analyze, that was really the only hurdle, getting that all pulled over. And then it's just been a, just been a matter of finding the faults, doing the analytical, trying to figure out what, what the root cause is and, and getting it corrected. Um, we were confident that, that we, would, we would have enough savings to cover the cost of, of the Panoptics installation in a very short period of time. And uh, we, we've done that and, and moved on. Oh, that's, that's great. So here's one that I think uh, any of the three of you might, uh, might be able to answer, but I'll, I'll start with you, Dale. Is, so uh, several people have asked, are there any rules of thumb uh, regarding the range of costs to implement ongoing commissioning? Any, any tips or, or, you know, for people who are trying to budget for this? Well, this is Jim Boucher. If, if you're doing a, a manual system, uh, Dale runs a big campus, so that would take a lot of spreadsheets. But if you're a smaller facility and you do it on uh, like the PMP guide, it can be very, very little cost. It can, the cost can be basically the hours of time you put into it. Um, now, for a larger system, Johnson Controls would have to tell you that uh, what we see is a lot of people um, don't have extensive, maybe that extensive a DDC system, and the cost to do it sometimes is prohibitive. So, uh, <clears throat> but if you do a manual system, it's fairly inexpensive, and then uh, Scott and uh, you guys, you would have to handle the other question. Right. All right, Tom, um, Jim. So um, there's actually two components to uh, connect onto a building for ongoing commissioning in the, the Panoptics uh, platform or uh, essentially any, any FDD automated type platform. Um, the first is, is connecting into the building. So uh, it, again, it depends on the um, the amount of work that would need to be done to get the building um, connected 
into the cloud to just keep it essentially very basic. So if it's a if it's a very if it's an old proprietary system, uh, there would be some um, integration that would be required to make the building um, connectable to a cloud-based format. Now um, that's and that's just so that's a, a one-time um, one-time cost. And if it's a newer BAS system, then the cost is is relatively low compared to if it's an older system that uh, may be more of a proprietary in nature. Uh, the second component is the the ongoing um, cost, which is a, a, a subscription-based cost. That, but essentially, um, it's the as um, you know, as Dale um, eluded the the, the um, benefit of having that ongoing diagnostics going on is that that um, the payback on that can generally be within a, a year or two years. Um, you know, because it is a, a a great benefit to have that continuous ongoing capability of being able to um, detect and diagnose faults remotely. Oh, that's great. So, so Dale, I'll give you a heads up. So here's a question that came in, and I think a couple others reflect this. Um, you know, one of the big challenges for a number of the companies here, it seems, is um, educating building occupants. And, you know, behavior can have a really big effect on energy savings. So, you know, like pulling down the blinds on a sunny day. So any perspectives on how you were able to educate such a you know big diverse campus full of people oh absolutely um, we, we we actually tied in uh, another dashboard uh, this product that we're using today is, is also a Johnson product it's called the green kiosk prior to that we, we actually used another vendor that did similarly the same thing we have uh, 16 resident halls on campus one, one of your biggest and most educatable group uh, of students. We were able to bring all 16 of those uh, <clears throat> resident halls live data, basically, on, on a dashboard that showed usage as, as it compared to a week ago. Um, make comparisons, real real easy comparisons, kind of fun comparisons with, um, you know, the cost to uh, boil ramen noodles or, or a cup, how much does it relate to a, a, a cup of coffee and, and that kind of thing. Having that information at, at something that that group recognizes and can relate with and something you can broadcast out there and have, have up there has been uh, absolutely a fantastic additional tool to the toolbox to help uh, with exactly what you're talking about. That's great. So, Jim, do you have any uh, examples to share or advice for for our uh, listeners? Well, you know, you know, basically, every building is slightly different. But if you watch these uh, systems, if you watch this, whether it's an automated system or a manual system, you you can achieve better performance. Uh, we did a large hospital where they asked us to come in, and th their only purpose was that we save them 10% of their energy a year. And we thought, well, that'll be interesting. And we were able to save 10% five years in a row. So to me, the most important thing is paying attention. Now, Dale has a bunch of data staring me in the face, but it's still up to his people to go make a change or to fix something that's not going right. So it's actually a, you need to have the data, but it's still a people business. And you need to have those people involved in it. Training the occupant, um, the best story I have of that is at Arizona State University, and they put dashboards in their, their dorm spaces, and they challenged the kids living in the dorms to compete with each other, and they saved 30, 35% in energy and did absolutely nothing. I mean, the occupants did it all. So basically, if you're training the people, letting them know that you're doing a good job and you're trying to be more efficient, the occupants actually appreciate that and will respond in a positive manner. Great. And we've got a, a follow-up question here. Uh, I'm not sure which one might want to address it, but how do you overcome any obstacles to customer 
adoption. So once in place, um, how do you overcome pushback, given that some operators may be skeptical of new ways of doing things and that something like OCX may be perceived as, as big brother? Well, this is Jim uh, O'Shea again. <clears throat> uh, we, we do worry about that when, when we're hired to go in a building. And uh, our, our job is to tell the operator we're here to help you. And we normally find that uh, the, the problems are cumulative. You know, the previous operator made a change uh, and did something that actually changes the way the system operates. And the previous operator tries to operate it in that fashion. But these little changes are accumulative. And that is the problem. The operators normally don't know how to solve that accumulated effect. So once you work with them and showing that you're there in their best interest to do a better job, you have to do a little training. Uh, you have to do a little encouragement. But we have never found anyone that has been belligerent about the process who who, who really cared about, about energy or performance of the building. Now, if they don't care, that's a problem we can't deal with. Uh, the Their, their management is going to have to deal with that. And this is Scott Gore. Just to add to what Jim just um, just explained, you know, I think it's it's really important to um, get the buy-in from the um, the people that run the building, especially the O&M staff, and just say, hey, you know, you all you, you can't be everywhere. You can't look at everything. This is a tool that's here to help you do your job better. And I I, I believe that when they really can understand that this it's not a threat, it's really there to to help them that they're to do their job better. They can't go look at every single VEV box in the building and, 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 and check the performance of it. But if once they have this tool available and they can see that, hey, you know, I can learn how to use this technology, i.e. this new tool, to do my job better so it makes them more valuable. Um, so I think a lot of it is just the, you know, how it's presented to, to the folks that run the building. Okay, and Scott, while, while I've got you there, um, another question here. I know we talked about sort of costs and pricing before, but, you know, um, one person wrote in, we looked at ongoing commissioning a few years ago, but the tools to identify problems were pretty expensive and they couldn't make a business case. So what, what has changed over the last few years? Right. Um, so, you know, the, the um, technology has... Um, is really matured on multiple levels, you know, making um, cloud-based FTD platforms more economical. Uh, again, it, it can, there's times they could fall into a, a six-year simple payback, but maybe a year, a year, a year simple payback. Um, so just a lot of tools and the technology has brought the, the cost down, um, you know, not getting down the nuts and bolts, but just ma um, point mapping. The point mapping and name recognition between how points are named of on the existing BAS system and how we have to bring those points into a cloud-based system. You know, there's there's tools, crawler tools, and things of that nature that have um, made that process much more efficient nowadays than it was was before. Um, you know, if, if that particular person would like to reach out to me um, individually, I'd be happy to speak with them, um, you know, about their, their situation. And every every building is different. Every situation is different. So um, they may just had a unique situation that caused the cost to be um, excessive in their eyes. Great. So uh, I want to sort of finish up for, for all three of you with a question, and, and I think I'll start with Jim. So, Jim, what are some of the lessons learned that you can share for people about to embark on, on this path of ongoing commissioning? Well, that, you know, we normally talk about technical lessons learned, but I won't fall off that cliff. There's a, there's a lot of technical lessons to be learned. But the, I think the, the most important thing to learn that this is a people process, that uh, it's not just gathering data, but we're dealing with the things that keep buildings from being uh, energy efficient and uh, uh, comfortable in the buildings is always goes back to people. It, uh, almost never do we find a part that's actually broken. We find a system that's been manipulated incorrectly. 
So remember it's a people uh, process, and what you're trying to do is influence the, the, the actions of your people. And, and I think that's the most important takeaway I would have from this. Okay, and just one follow-up for you, Jim, just to be clear for our audience. So we've got several different questions to ask. Is there a difference between ongoing commissioning and persistent commissioning and continuous commissioning? Uh, what's, what's the right terminology? I know you corrected me at the top of this, but just to make it clear for everyone. They're actually all the same. Uh, <clears throat> the industry is having a little trouble with the name, but basically it's just the process of trying to get better and better and better. And I'm not sure that the word commissioning fits it very well, but that's what the industry is using. And ASHRAE has adopted ongoing commissioning, um, uh, in a, in a, in a basically they're all the same. So you don't need to worry about a meaning different things. Good. Yeah, and I think your point about it being ongoing operations and, you know, your focus on sort of a Six Sigma or approach to it is really the right direction. Um, so, Dale, let me ask you. So what are, what are some of the lessons learned for people who are, you know, not as far along as you that you can share with them? Uh, I have a vice president here who, who coined a phrase who, who has um, <clears throat> been out there for, for a while now with other, other people picking up on it. Um, you, you cannot manage what you do not measure and you do not understand. Um, get, getting the information, whether you get it automated or, or whether you're pulling it off a spreadsheet, um, if, if you don't know what your systems are doing, what your utilities cost you, uh, if, if you're not tracking this in, in detail, then the, you know you, you you've got to get there as a first step to, to being able to get your arms around in any kind of energy management, any any kind of uh, utility management. That's great. And uh, Scott, what what's your advice? What are some of the lessons you've learned that you can share? Sort of final thoughts for our audience. Right. Uh, well, um, the, the the points that um, that Jim and, and Dale made are right on target. Um, I would say that it's you know as a lot of it depends on the size of the building. If you just have a smaller building, you know, like we'll have the process Jim explained in the beginning, um, you know that that process may work work well. But if you have larger buildings, especially portfolios of buildings, um, it's really good to have some a, a process that that is more automated. Um, you have people that leave facilities all the time, and if there's not a process, a system in place that can really um, provide an ongoing commissioning platform that is scalable, it's very difficult to make it persist over time. No, oh, that's great. Well, uh, we're almost at the top of the hour, and that's all the time we have for today's Q&A and presentation. So I'd, I'd like to thank Jim Boucher from Commissioning Concepts, Scott Gordon from Johnson Controls, and Dale Dyer from Western Kentucky University for a really great and informative conversation. And as always, for the latest news, tools, and best practices on sustainable business, and not to mention upcoming webcasts like this one, visit greenbiz.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter, Green Buzz. On behalf of my colleagues at Green Biz Group, thanks so much for attending today's webcast. I'm John Davies. Until next time, have a great day.